David Cronenberg's The Fly is a really strong example of what makes a horror film work. You have all the necessary elements there. You have gory special effects. I mean, really, really gory special effects. Wonderful stuff. Vomit, blood, it's great. And you also have a key heart in the middle of the whole thing that brings the all the spectacle and everything together. It isn't just a monster movie. Certainly, there's a great monster in it, and the monster is spectacular to look at, but it's what's underneath the skin of the monster that really matters, and that's where Jeff Goldblum comes in. Jeff Goldblum is the character to look after. Jeff Goldblum is amazing in this movie. This is the movie that really started off his whole um, I am a science nerd, look at me sort of persona. It began with this. It ended up accumulating into Jurassic Park and definitely in Independence Day. That's pretty much where his career was screwed. But you can definitely see, like, why Jeff Goldblum became a star at this point because Jeff Goldblum is fantastic in this movie. I think it's definitely Oscar-worthy stuff that he pulls off in this film, especially considering how much makeup he acts under 90% of the time. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. What's the plot of this story, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you, it's really quite a special one. It's a remake. Everybody loves remakes, so why not? But just to be clear here, this movie has almost very little to do with the original Vincent Price story, other than the fact that it has telepods, and it also so happens to have a fly. Basically, the scientist, he's trying to figure out a new means of transportation and everything, and he figures, oh, hey, you know, teleportation. Why not? It worked in the sci-fi movies. And Gina Davis is a reporter who he ends up seducing into this whole thing, and he tells her that, you know, I have got a an experiment here that's really going to blow your mind. And she's kind of like, oh, yeah, really? Show it to me then. So she ends up going back to his apartment and realizing, oh, my God, he actually does have real, live, working telepods. It's, it's amazing to her. It's mind-blowing, as it obviously should be. She wants to report on this, and he ends up going, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. This cannot come out to the public yet. But I will make a deal with you. If you study me, like practically live with me day by day throughout the process of working these telepods, I will give you a book deal. And you can chronicle my entire existence right now. And you can also report on me stepping into the telepod, the first human teleportation ever to be conceived. And it will be the conclusion of your book. And of course, her being the reporter that she is, she's like, fantastic! But of course, in, just like in every horror tragedy, things have to go wrong, and when things go wrong, they go majorly wrong here. A fly so happens to fly in when Jeff Goldblum is going to teleport himself, meaning that a fusion happens between Ge Jeff Goldblum, or whatever the name of Jeff Goldblum's character is. Honestly, who cares? He's just Jeff Goldblum at this point. He merges with this fly, and he basically becomes Brundlefly. He is a perfect mix between the character of Seth Brundle and this ordinary housefly. The transformation between the two, though, happens rather slowly. At first, he feels great, and then later on, he's not feeling so great. And then he begins to realize, oh, wait, there's appendages coming out of my chest where there wasn't used to be appendages before. The whole transformation is really... One of the highlights of the film, though, I do feel it distracts from some of the personal drama that's going on. There are points where it seems like some of the sci-fi gimmicky stuff is too much in the forefront where I feel it should have been a little more in the background. That isn't to say that the drama still isn't there because it's definitely a key component. There's just points where it feels a little bit goofy, a little bit more gimmicky than I would have liked, but that's really starting to nitpick because one of the beauties of this film and it really is. When I was watching it, one of the first thoughts that came to mind is, oh my god, this is a horror film. This is like a chick flick horror film, watching this. And this comes across as kind of a strange comment, especially from David Cronenberg fans who might be listening to this going, oh, uh, what do you mean by that? And what I mean by this is, there's a lot of elements in this that almost seem to be directed on the emotional level of women, to a degree. I mean, you have this character, the story in my opinion, is told mostly from the perspective of Gina Davis after a while, watching as this man she once loved or once lusted after, whatever you want to put it. I'm going to say love because I do think this is a love story. She's watching him slowly transform into this grotesque monster. And that's really a... That's a heartbreaking sort of story. It reminds me of the kind of stuff you would see in um, A Walk to Remember, although A Walk to Remember is crap, so... Let's let's forget I even said that. It reminds me of something you'd see out of a really tragic romance. And that's what elevates this above so many other horror films. Rather than just being 
boo, gotcha, and ooh, gore, and ah, jump scare. Every time something horrific happens, there's usually this emotional undercurrent that comes through, especially in the film's finale, which is emotionally charged as hell. You really feel for these characters, especially Seth Brundle and the Gina Davis reporter. You're sitting here watching them going, oh my god, if I were in this situation, I would totally flip out. And I don't do that a lot with horror films. I don't really put myself in these situations. There's a beautiful speech by Seth Brundle in the middle of the film where he quite literally says, um, have you heard of insect politics? And she turns to him and she says, no. And he says, neither do I. Insects don't have politics. And it goes into this speech, which is really quite strong, and it really sums up, I think, the whole of the film's themes overall. So if you're looking for a more educated horror film, perhaps something with a bit more um, richness, a bit more character depth, I would definitely recommend this. This is not only one for the horror fans, but one for fans of films in general. There's, I have a few complaints, mostly with the sci-fi goofiness that occasionally happens, and the fact that the, uh, the computer in the lab seems to give away every single plot detail as it unfolds. I mean, literally, the thing is like an encyclopedia of, okay, for those of you who haven't been able to follow the story so far, yeah, here's um, basically what happened. And it, that, that seemed a little bit cheap to me, the fact that you have this computer, especially in 1986, that can a answer quite practically every single question that the characters have at any given point. But besides that, you know, this is really one to check out. It's unique, it's fresh, and it definitely has that sort of David Cronen Cronenberg uh, grittiness to it. So it's highly recommended by me. I think, on a whole, if I were to be really critical about it and go through point by point, this would be a three out of four, because there are definitely some problems, some plot hiccups, but it's still, you know, a good, well-constructed movie. I think from my personal experience, especially by the fact that I felt like throwing up during certain points, which is always a good sign in a horror movie, I would give this a three and a half out of four for my personal enjoyment. I, I love the hell out of this, this movie, and I would gladly watch it again.